Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, panelists, for joining. Uh, I read a quote somewhere that said that uh, great, good marketing makes the company look smart, but great marketing makes the consumer feel smart, right? Uh, we know that agencies have a very critical role to play in today's multi-channel, multimedia world. Uh, especially when it comes to getting the brand's messaging right to the key TGs that you want to target, uh, especially those, are, those who are in market, uh, to, establish the, uh, to establish the right connect with the brands, right? And today we are talking about establish, uh, establishing that connect with in-market audiences and uh, how do you foster that meaningfully. I think for the benefit of our gentle listeners here today, I just want to uh, quickly elaborate what we mean by in-market audiences. So in-market audiences are essentially customers who are actively researching products or services uh, by browsing pages across the web uh, with a clear intent to make a purchase uh, very soon, right? Which means from a brand's perspective, they are already primed. Uh, to buy what you have to offer. So obviously tapping them with the right messaging will uh, increases the likelihood of uh, conversions and gives you more bang for your buck, so to speak, right? So with that in mind, I think I want to open up the panel and uh, pose the first question just across the board like this with you, Saksham. Um, just give me a answer. So as you work with multiple brands and each tends to have a diverse TG, so to speak, right? How do you balance different media platforms to effectively position a brand and engage with in-market audiences? See, uh, my experience in-market audience is a very defined data set. Right. So there is affinity-based buying that happens. Yeah. You have to go contextual. Yes. Uh, there is a larger play of the overall affiliate ecosystem. Yes, you work with, for example, in the field of tech, you work with tech blogger community. There are mm -hmm. key opinion leaders. There are a lot of these bloggers, publishers, etc., that you integrate, and they uh, play a huge role in the consideration funnel. Uh, there is also the whole CRM database play, mm -hmm. uh, because you know uh, there is a captive audience that you are sitting with, so we have to engage with that database. That play happens. Uh, for me, the defining bit of choice of platform is uh, you know the guidance becomes the whole data set that one has. And all you know, uh, the value proposition in some cases is lesser about the product and it's more about the convenience of buying it. Yeah. Case in point would be, uh, you know, a quick commerce platform delivering a premium and smartphone in 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so that's what defines probably the messaging, which is the accessibility and the convenience aspect of it, and lesser about the product probably. Yeah. So uh, in market, uh, with those data sets, that's how you kind of contextualize across platforms. Yeah. I think I'll just, yeah. Rahul, what's your view on that? So for me, first we need to, for in the market audiences, I would say first we need to understand the audience persona, what they actually are doing. And if we have the first party data, we can use the data in, in Densu, specifically what we do, you do, we have our own proprietary tool, that's, that's Densu Marketing Cloud. We use this tool which help us to slice and dice the audiences and understand their behavior, content consumption, habit, platform, genre, even up to the program level. Once we understand that, then we ride on that and then we tend to target these audiences more. Because unless and until we understand the market audience, in market audiences generally would only be people who are searching in Google or on Amazon on, in that, but it's more than that also. Mm -hmm. If we understand audience behavior, niche audience behavior, every, most it become broader and wider and then we can target more people. Otherwise, we'll stick to that only in market audience only to Google or marketplaces. Absolutely. I think we need to be like uh, revisiting the data constantly, uh, look at new markers because otherwise it becomes a very stagnant set. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll pass it on to Gurjot. Yeah, so uh, I'll add a bit more to what Rahul said and actually go back to the question where you asked that. How do we go about selecting the right platforms, right? Yeah. There was a, there was a time about 10 years back when we used to refer to tools like Comscore mm -hmm. and look at how do we go about the right selection of platforms for any owner. And you would see some top four or five platforms, top four or five in tech, top four or five in price comparison, top four, five in, uh, you know, all genres that you'll pick up. But today, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about some 
like a plethora of platforms being available, right? Yeah. You mentioned in the beginning that smart marketers make brands, uh, smart marketing makes brand look smart and smart marketers make consumers. Great marketing makes consumers feel smart, yeah. That's our responsibility, yeah, right? Yeah. So as marketers, it's important that we don't just go for what we see in the tools, what we see in the data, mm -hmm. uh, but we also marry the context back. Uh, there can be various reasons, talking about 91 mobiles. Mm. Uh, you will have some several competing platforms with you, right? You will have a GSM Arena, you will have a Softonic and so many more. But how is a marketer choosing a specific platform? There would be one platform which is more from price comparison and the other more from product comparison. And that, that, that fine understanding of the platform is not there in the tools. Mm. It's there when you stitch the entire picture together of creative, media, and technology. Right. And I think that's extremely important as marketers for us to take the decision uh, on which platforms to go after. Uh, do not get biased with just the buying prowess. Mm. Do not get taken away by the best rates and deals mm. because ultimately it's about the long-term solve that we are here for for the brands. And yeah, and I think we spoke about in-market is huge. There was a time Google was riding on this, but now with the DSPs coming in, Amazon, Flipkart, everyone is on it. Yeah. Um, and I would just add one small bit is that in-market is not just about bottom funnel. Yeah. I think it's important to engage with the audiences early on. So right message with the right media, the right platform is extremely important to yeah. make customer a success. Absolutely. Move on to Arpita. Uh, so I think that we need to look at this twofold. Uh, one is from the audience's perspective and one is also from the brand's perspective. Uh, you know, many a times uh, there, there are a set of medias that we identify and isolate and, you know, basis the data and the analytics. Uh, you know, consider that, okay, these are my top set of media that I will probably be using in this particular campaign and, you know, this is how I will address my, um, uh, in, uh, my target audience. Uh, it also has to look at from the point of view of what am I trying to convey, what are my products USPs, and which media outlet would suit best to that tonality. So that fine qualitative assessment along with the quantitative assessment is something that the brand sort of, you know, brings in an agency for. Yeah. And, you know, that's where we step in as custodians on behalf of the brand to do that fine analysis. Uh, the second aspect of this, of course, are, uh, you know, very frankly, budgets. Mm. You know, that every campaign, every product, um, you know, has certain budgets. There are certain ROIs or KPIs in place. Uh, we need to best optimize, uh, you know, those KPIs and ROIs versus the budget that's available. So in terms of being able to do that, would I be comfortably be able to position certain media which are bound to get uh, the brand the maximum sort of attention from the audience uh, versus I can do a more generic campaign. So I think uh, that fine balance is something, uh, you know, the agency sort of need to bring on board, both in terms of quality and in terms of the quantity. Makes sense. So I think, Arpita, we can start with, uh, we can sort of double click on that a little bit. Uh, do you have any best practices on how do you strike that right balance, right? And especially from an agency perspective, when you are doing this for multiple brands with competing messages, often intended for the same TG. So how do you balance the right mix of media, right messaging uh, to deliver the brand's uh, uh, objective? Um, so usually, uh, see, the, we have to sort of realize that there always tends to be a certain amount of overlap when we are looking at brands who are in a particular segment. Uh, you know, and that overlap will stay. That is the inherent um, sort of negative of, you know, having multiple brands within the same industry. Mm. Having said that, I think uh, it is as much as an agency's uh, uh, contribution as it is the brand's contribution to realize authenticity in their uh, target audience, mm -hmm. you know. I may feel that an X brand is doing an X campaign and being able to reach out to Y audiences. I need to be absolutely sure as a brand and as an agency together uh, that, you know, I identify my brand persona and the target audience accordingly. 
knowing my audience and knowing their inherent interests, their, uh, you know, their likes, their dislikes, their choices, uh, defines my content strategy. And then my content strategy defines my media because that's the tonality the media is going to take, right? So although there will always be an overlap, you can finally distinguish between campaigns from brand A and brand B. Having said that, uh, when we do this particular process, the USP that the brand is trying to communicate, and in my language, I call it a catch point. Uh, so when I'm looking at my journey or the brand's journey of interacting with an audience, I look at a long-term narrative, which every brand tends to build over a period of time, and then there are catch points. Catch points are interesting points that we are able to identify in our campaigns, wherein we are able to catch the audience's attention. Uh, because audiences these days are, have, or I feel, have high amount of brand stickiness, but their attention span is very, very minimal. Right? So if I'm able to create these catch points or these areas of interest along building a narrative, uh, then I think my campaigns uh, tend to, over a period of time, differentiate between two brands. That's where it is very, very important for brands to continue to engage with the agency and share data and vice versa. Because many a times uh, on some of the campaigns, you know, the data doesn't flow easily. So once you have access to the data and there's that kind of relationship between the brand and the agency, this over a period of time is able to create the right difference. That, yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, coming to you, Saksham, uh, Arpita talked about it from dealing with multiple brand perspective. But I think in the smartphone space, we know that we have brands which have different product lines within, uh, within themselves, right? within one particular brand, catering uh, in different price segments. So what are the nuances there? Uh, in getting your messaging right with distinct offerings in place? So there is a lot of market sensing that keeps happening throughout the year, right? You pick up uh, feedback from the channel, yeah. plus the whole sentiment play. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the network talks to us. Uh, so we get all of that in. Uh, there is definitely a price ladder conversation that happens yeah. uh, in terms of marketing efforts and, you know, you're talking about tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. Uh, so there is engagement. You are trying to play the perception angle with some uh, products probably. And uh, some of those are more about the whole value play. Right. Because uh, that's how Indian market is. Like customers fairly sensitive to grab the next deal. Yeah. Uh, there is also a larger seasonality play that has been observed uh, with the emergence of social commerce and D2C brands right. and quick commerce, etc wherein uh, it is more about, uh, you know, what deal that I'm able to manage. And, you know, you know also you're also playing the whole logistical part there right. uh, within the mix. So between the tactical, there are sh short-term goals, obviously, you, you're trying to achieve from yeah. an ROI attribution. And there is real-time data that you pick up, like yeah. how an asset is performing. You, you will pick that, all, all of those insights, etc. cetera. Uh, I will actually build on what Arpit was saying about this whole uh, touch point aspect of it. Uh, I think we've evolved to an era where it is more about customer experience marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to really kind of own the whole micro macro moments. Yeah. And that will happen across, you know, where the consumer interests are, uh, in what value chain you're operating, uh, what sort of a price is the consumer willing to pay for the product, etc. So that's real time sensing that we pick up and accordingly the, uh, the whole media platform uh, strategy kind of evolves. That makes sense, yeah. Uh, Rahul, uh, what's your view on this? Because, you know, at Densu, you have uh, brands that uh, sort of cater to affordable segments, then you have brands catering to very premium segments, right? And it's a very easy to sort of get the, the, very easy to get the brand message diluted if you don't strike the right balance. So, yeah, how do you go about identifying the right markers uh, to deploy your strategy? <coughs> so, when user buy a product, everybody has their own intent. I might buy a phone because it's very fast. Somebody might have my bite of buy a phone who is a gamer. Mm. Somebody might buy it for a camera. So we first need to understand the audience segmentation and we need to make a niche bucket of the audiences and understand what the requirement are. And if we have the first party data, we can further build on that data and understand and see the niche audience segmented. Once we do that, it could be a premium and a non-premium brand, a premium uh, expensive product, it might be because it's a lifestyle product, 
they might like it. But for some people, it might be more ROI driven. Mm -hmm. Battery life is good, things like that. So we understand that both audience segments. When so we divide that, then proper channelization is required. What type of media touch points they go. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple tools. Gujot also mentioned earlier there was global tool, then every agency have their own customized in-house tool. We need to understand what type of channel selection are they into. And once we understand that some might be on the non-premium audiences might be on YouTube, Facebook, but if it's a premium iPhone launch or something like that, will we go with the more premium uh, websites or a uh, vendors? And once we do that, after the channelization, then we need to understand the message because uh, for a non-premium phone, the messaging overarching thought could be same, but it could be more offer-led mm. uh, deals, things like that. But for other, the messaging, the CTA need to be very precise and different. It's more experiential product, our iPhone is more experiential product. And after that, the dynamic budget optimization while we run a campaign because it's an ROI driven. So uh, of, for the brand, which are the economical phone, the, the, C, the KPI matrix would be more clicks, leads, conversion. But for iPhone, it might be more experience and a lifetime value of the particular users. That makes sense. So I think, Gujot, uh, turning to you now, we've talked a lot about segmentation in general, right? But there's also about getting the message right. Like, how do you personalize it? You've, you've gotten all these markers, you've identified your key cohorts, you know whom to tap, but how do you get the messaging right? And that has to be a mix of data and creativity, right? You can't just, based on data, come up with the message. So what's, uh, what's your strategy there? Like, what's Group M's, uh, Essence Me uh, Media Comms typical strategy there? We'll, we'll come to what uh, Group M and Essence Mediacom does at play. There's a lot, but I'll go back to what Arpita said. He used the word responsibility four times. And uh, as agencies, it is our responsibility very much to do responsible marketing for the brands that we work with, right? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the amount of media choices we have today are immense, mm -hmm. but it's about how do we pick up the right one? Rahul again mentioned about some tools, etc. but I really feel is that tools are as good as the people who are operating those, right? Because again, uh, you know, uh, the kind of data uh, that's been fed to the tools is immense. And the kind of signals that are available today are so many that uh, you end up overdoing it sometimes, right? So, so being responsible marketeers is extremely important, again, to understand the context. Um, you know, I think what's really important is, I mean, let's, let's look at the room. We are, we are a lot of brands, uh, agencies sitting here. I think what's really important to crack what you said, uh, Praj, is uh, to do collaboration ground up. Uh, how many times has it happened where the briefing to the media, technology, and creative agencies have happened together? I mean, I have personally been in those rooms, insisted brands on doing that, but that really is a scenario, right? And that's where the problem is. The media and creative are not talking to each other because they are so strong walled gardens today. Uh, it completely breaks it there. So uh, I think it's a collaborative play between brands, agencies, and on agency side, uh, you know, both creative media and, and all of that. Because as Sherpas, I mean, I, I call ourselves as Sherpas because we have done that Mount Everest or K2 journey so many times that we know at what stage what will be required. Uh, so it's important that, uh, you know, right at the beginning, uh, the collaboration is done where the briefing happens together. Sometimes maybe creative and media agencies need to jam together before the final approach or the long-term marketing solve has been presented. So that's the first important aspect. Uh, another important aspect is, uh, you know, again, to the audience, uh, when was it last that you paid slightly lesser for a beautiful and a very lucrative print ad? Did you ever pay less because the ad was so good? Did you ever pay half the cost because the TV commercial ran so successfully and it had an offer that was never heard before? No, right? So digital is the only media where creative subsidizes the cost of media. Yeah. The only place. Uh, if your communication is better, you end up paying better, you end up being better CPCs, rather lower CPCs, which means a lower cost of acquisition. So uh, in digital, it's all the way more important for all the marketers to take the responsibility of bringing the message and medium together. Uh, you use the word personalization, that's very important, but overdoing it is a crime. So, uh, and, and it's important, I mean, we, we keep hearing about cookie less and I'm not going to talk about too many things, there's a clock ticking right in front of me. So. <laughs> 
uh, I'll skip the entire cookie-less and AI narrative. You all are well versed with it. But I think let's go back to the basics. Let's just do collaboration ground up. Let's make sure uh, that both message and medium are talking to each other, especially in digital. And that is what delivers the delight for the consumer and the most effective strategies for the brands. Absolutely. I think just like going a little deeper there, um, we are of course talking about uh, why it's important to tap in-market audiences because you get more bang for your buck. But I think there's also, uh, brands also need to invest in some halo branding activities, right? To keep your products in consumer consciousness. And that's a hard, hard balance to strike. Uh, so I think Saksham, I'll start with you. Do you have any views there? Like how do you ensure that you get, yeah. For me, uh, honestly, it's a fairly long-term play. Yeah. Uh, you don't build brands and the whole trust and authenticity around them, etc. Yeah. Uh, in a short term, right? Unless there is a complete value disruption that you're doing, right? So uh, probably what an Indigo did to in yeah. the, uh, to the airline industry yeah. or what Paytm did to payments, etc. And all that. So uh, it is long term. Uh, you have to own all the micro macro moments, plus post ownership. Mm. Uh, how uh, you know connected you are in the overall journey uh, is where the play is, and uh, you know it takes a lot of sustained effort for brands to probably achieve that, mm. and you have to do this in a sustained manner. That's where you know the whole aspect of integration integration comes in. Yeah. Uh, how the multiple agencies are kind of working together. In fact, at Chale, we've been able to crack this model. Uh, we call this the business connected approach, right. uh, which is you know, across all the touch points that the consumer is going through, whether it's retail, online, offline, mm -hmm. marketplaces, your ORM, CRM, uh, brand experience, etc. All of that is an integrated solution that we try to kind of offer. And uh, we, in other words, we also call it customer experience marketing. Right. So that's definitely a play and I think that's where agencies have to evolve yeah. in, in the kind of product, uh, you know, we are offering because as the media aspect goes more and more diverse, it's integration, how do you kind of maintain one voice, one aspect, how yeah. do you build that brand, holistically in a cohesive manner, it needs absolute grip. Yeah, absolutely. Rahul. So whenever a brand set their media budget or a business KPI, they should set up it for a long term KPI and a short term KPI in order to build a whole host, whole uh, that hello effect of a brand or a, so for the short term KPI the budget need to be used for their marketing objective where they need to build more ROI or a short term mm -hmm. outcome but they also need to build awareness for a brand or a loyalty for a brand or brand love for that it could as he mentioned it will take a long time and they need to invest slowly and regularly and be a consistent on that not just count to a I didn't get an ROI, I didn't get leads, because brand asks things like that, but on the long term, if you need to build that the upper fallen audiences for your brand and you need to build that loyalty for the brand, you need to keep on tapping to the newer audiences and bringing to your subset. Once they are into the funnel, they will gradually come down to the lower funnel matrix and you will get an ROI. Yeah. So that's all. No, absolutely, and I think it ties back to Gurjot's point about having a sitting at the table together and doing those discussions, right? Like, what's your long-term vision for the brand? It can't be just KPI-driven. Like, loyalty doesn't come about overnight. So, I think Gurjot, if you could add to that, and then yeah. move to our. So, your question is around how important is it for uh, media or for marketing overall to contribute towards building a brand, right? Yeah. I think it completely depends on the journey of the brand. Uh, Often we do this mistake where we're, we're building a brand for a brand that's already been built. Mm. Uh, that's not really required. I think what, uh, if most of you would have heard this term called ad stock, right? If Samsung today stops advertising, I don't think so the nation will forget. I'm not sure about other markets, but specifically talking about India. Mm. So they would easily have an ad stock of about a year or two, right? Even if they stop advertising. So maybe if they decide to one day, God forbid, they should not. <laughs> Some of us will lose jobs, no, I don't think we but yeah. That. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think uh, let's say a, a Coke or or Colgate uh, or any of these brands which have been built stops advertising today, um, they will have enough ad stock which will last a few years, and maybe that time can be used. There have been brands who've done that, right? They have leveraged on the ad stock and they focused a lot more on. What say to the words the fag end of the funnel is about building loyalty on how do we get the customer to buy same customer to buy more 
instead of more customers buying more, right? So um, it completely depends. Uh, and if, if Mama Earth dares to do something similar, God bless them. That, that's not going to work, right? So again, I'm taking two extreme examples of a brand which has recently been built and a brand that has been built over years. It completely depends. Uh, and as marketers, again, uh, talking about building trust, uh, authenticity, uh, it, it's important that we understand the brand's objectives very clearly and not use the word awareness in every pitch presentation or every conversation that we do. We have to move away from those keywords and really work towards building a solution that our brand is required. Yeah, yeah um, I think as brands and as their partners, and I would include publishers to be a part of this entire complex, I think we need to collectively understand whether they are legacy brands or new age brands, right? Um, just like audiences who are born in different eras perceive information and acceptance, I think brands operate like entities in the same manner. So I think legacy brands have a lot of advantage in terms of being able to, you know, like uh, Gujot said, build up on that legacy. And, you know, there is a certain amount of traction that is already coming in. Whereas new age brands often tend to try new things and new tricks in the book to be able to catch the audience attention. So uh, once the brand and the agency partners together realize that in that brand journey where you are, I think you can optimally decide on what kind of spends would you want to keep on the long term narrative and what kind of spends would you want to sort of you know, isolate for individual marketing campaigns. I think that really helps uh, year on year to be able to make the campaigns that much more successful. Yeah. Uh, there has to be a long term narrative building, uh, there definitely has to be, uh, that is without any question, but how much of it? I think is depending on the individual brand's journey and year on year brands do grow, right? So what a brand was say five years ago, it wouldn't be at the same position now. Yeah. So does it need to continue to spend that kind of money on that narrative building or can it or has it developed enough uh, legacy to be able to bank on that? I think that's a smooth journey which the agency and the brands and even publishers uh, need to bring on the table and and my urge to a lot of publishers would be you know uh, there is always constant pressures on selling the campaigns and you know bringing in that kind of advertising money and so and so forth but if publishers are able to offer insights onto that kind of uh, journey they become long-term partners right. you know and then that becomes a community that you drive on uh, you can go back to them on insights and what's happening with the audiences because, you know, there's a lot of information that they have. So I think uh, that community building, if a brand is able to do that fine balance between the spends and the narrative building, it, it's always an uphill task, but it becomes that much more, uh, you know, easy to do. Very pertinent point. I think one quick follow-up there. Um, the long-term narrative, of course, takes time, right? And when we are talking, at least in the smartphone space, the shelf life is very short, right? We're talking about two, two and a half months, especially sub 30, 35K. Um, how do you drive that narrative? Because you're chasing KPIs and uh, you're not really, what are the bigger metrics that you're tracking uh, for customer trust, loyalty? Sakship, do you have a view there? So I think tech is all about building a trend. Yeah. And it is short term. Yeah. That's how uh, fast tech is evolving. Yeah. Uh, we work a lot in the affiliate network. Uh, we work with amplifiers. Uh, the whole influencer relationship management, that, that comes into play. Uh, publisher network, etc. Because audience is definitely the in-market audience is looking for all those, you know, recommendations, etc. Uh, in the premium end of smartphones, uh, there is definitely a play of going one up, right? This, yeah. this whole Android versus Apple yeah. uh, ecosystem, OS conversation. All of us kind of interact with uh, kind of such content, content yeah. whether it's on reels and then you see content on meta etc right so so that definitely plays a huge huge role uh, you have to really kind of build a trend yeah. around launches etc because that drives the larger perception yeah. what sort of walk-ins are happening are people inquiring about the product are they searching for it and there is real-time metric right you would know that hey if if how the search query volumes are happening yeah. how many website visits are happening so that's real-time sensing that we pick up and you kind of try and modify that yeah. 
uh, for me, it's, it's the cusp between reach and relevance. Right. And uh, that's where uh, the whole messaging part, creative aspect of it, and the media part kind of uh, have to kind of come together. Yeah. So yeah. we know that technology is changing very fast. I started with a landline phone, then to a pager, to a cell phone, smartphone, <laughs> touch screen. So people from 80s might have seen a lot of changes in the technology. But I think technology is very competitive and they must need to predict the future, what to come next. And unless and until they do that, they can't specialize in the market because they, people are changing. So for that, they need to get in touch with the consumer, mm -hmm. the subject matter expert, and continuously do the research and R&D to see, to predict the future. They are the yeah, gods, the I think. <laughs> yes, future is important, uh, predicting, you know, what trend to latch on to is important, but I feel it's a far more important aspect on what a brand takes a stand for. Smartphone seems to be a very interesting topic of this panel. I'll move away a bit, even though I consult one of the large emerging smartphone players in the country, but uh, let's take a different example. Let's take an auto example, right? Today, uh, you, look at, you look at an influx of the auto category and the big shift that's happening from fuel to EV, right? However, if you go back a bit in the past, Again, leveraging trends, we heard Udit from MG in the previous panel, we heard Mayank from Vivo. We were all talking about how we've kept an eye on the horizon, we've understood what's, what's the new technology we've, we're gonna be facing and we've latched onto that. But I feel what's more important is, yes, future is important, but present is more important. Uh, it's important if you look at, again, going back to the auto category example, Maruti has clearly taken uh, a route of amazing serviceability post-sales. Uh, look at BMW, clear positioning. You want to be in the driving seat. Look at Mercedes, clear positioning. You want to be in the seat behind uh, because there are more luxuries in the seat behind than the buttons in the front, right? So I think what's important is a brand needs to take a stand. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, in a country and an economy like ours, consumers are spoiled by choices. Yeah. There's so many. So it's important that you identify as a brand what's your strength and what can you bring to the customer time to time? And the promise you make to the customer, you live up to that promise like many auto brands have done. And of course, smartphone brands have also done that. Yeah. But I feel it's about the promise you give to the customer and take a stand for that promise. That's what helps uh, you know, our brand to build a long-term relationship with its customers. Absolutely. I think you need to bypass the price sensitivity. I think the delivering on that promise uh, is the key. Yeah. Um, so marketing is is a part of it like Gurjot said you know the brands need to uh, keep up to the promise and there's a long chain in that you know there is product there's service there's you know experience with the product later on so I think for, for brands uh, it is important to identify who they are and who they want to be uh, the market is changing so fast, I think there are new terminologies coming in every single day. And I think in another five years, once, you know, the 14, 15, 16 years olds will get more spending power, the market is drastically going to change because that, that is a very demanding audience, right? Uh, so to keep up with the trends, to keep up with, uh, you know, what's happening or to look at the horizon is important, but I completely agree, agree with Gurjot. I think you, the brand needs to stand for, you know, who they are and who they want to be. And at the same time, uh, again, it has to be a collaborative exercise because, you know, there is as much as a brand can reach out. So agency partners and publishers sort of become you know, their eyes and ears in terms of consumer insights, in terms of understanding the trends, in terms of understanding how they can continue to build their brand narrative. So I think uh, it has to still continue to be a collaborative exercise. Thank you so much. I think just one last question because we talked about future with Gen AI and AI being the buzzword. How, you, how do you see that changing uh, how we identify in-market cohorts? Any quick thoughts? Gurjot, I think you seem to have a view about that, so I'll let you... I also see the time's up, yeah. red screen in front of me. <laughs> and it's a customary to say, we are in between you and lunch. We have to say, how can this panel end before saying that? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, again, uh, I think AI probably would be new uh, when it comes to consumers facing it, but it's already been there in the, in the platforms which are used for marketing. Let that be, let that be double click, yeah. uh, let that be meta, let that be any programmatic player uh, in the room or outside. Um, 
Uh, I don't think so. AI is new for marketing. AI has been around, but there is more responsibility on marketers to leverage it right. And uh, like I said, I think we should look at the keyword in market or that trait to understand and to engage with the person before the or rather the consumer before the consumer moves to in market so that there's already an informed decision that's being made. So I think AI has been around. I would not add more jargons to it, but yeah, that's what I feel. I think there's a conflict between how personalized you can go yeah. and uh, you know over access. Mm. Personalization versus privacy. Yeah. So that's a conflict. I think marketers have to kind of work with that. Uh, there are a lot of compliance conversations, legal conversations around AI, use of AI uh, in marketing, etc. So yeah, so it will evolve for yeah. sure. Uh, and you know, it's, it's the trend we're talking about. A uh, lot of brands have spoken about on-device capability yeah. of AI, so and also responsible use of AI. Yeah. Uh, it's something that I think as an ecosystem we need to mature out to. Yeah. So, yeah. And watch this space. Okay. Yes, watch this I space. I think AI you. is going to be a, a used and an abused terminology, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when things want to be trendy, we say, okay, it's got AI, yeah. right? But it's been around for a while. Uh, how it will be utilized, how its application, uh, you know, will make campaigns and marketing that much more effective, I think it's really evolving because newer things, newer compliances, there's a lot of, um, you know, compliance aspect also to it with AI moving into the country and, you know, expanding in terms of whether it's products or services and so on and so forth. There will be a lot of compliances. So I think we would probably need to see how, uh, you know, things are going to move forward. And we are maybe looking at bigger brands like, you know, Samsung with uh, bigger spends to sort of, take the leap and try it out and test it out to see how, how we can sort of then apply it to some of the other brands, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. I think we're up on time. So thank you so much, panelists. Thank you for your time. I think we sense an impatient audience ready to go for lunch. So thank you, everyone, for your time.